Hi, I'm Bob Herbert. Welcome to Op-Ed.TV. What to do about crime? Politicians have been stumbling over one another for decades trying to prove how tough they can be. They've howled about the death penalty and put draconian laws on the books. We have the largest prison population in the world, but as often as not, the inmates are not violent criminals, but drug addicts and men and women suffering from mental illness and poor people who can't pay their fines or post bail. Amid the din, one generation after another of young black men, especially in our inner cities, remains at serious risk from the violence of their peers and also, at times, from the brutality of law enforcement officials. It is estimated that one out of every three black boys born today will end up in jail or prison at some point. How do we fight back? What works and what doesn't when we're trying to help young people at risk? What's a reasonable model of policing? We'll delve into all of this with my guest, Professor David Kennedy of the John Jay College of Criminal Justice here at CUNY. Professor Kennedy has spent years engaging the challenges of crime and policing in urban America, and he is the director of the National Network for Safe Communities at John Jay. Professor Kennedy, welcome. Nice. Thanks so much for coming in. I appreciate it. So the public is always worried about crime, but um, lately, increasingly, uh, there's been concern over um, police misconduct. Uh, we've had the stop and frisk controversy here in New York. We've had uh, protests and videos uh, connected with police misconduct nationally. Um, put this in perspective for us. Uh, how serious a problem is police misconduct? And why, has, why have these problems persisted for so long? So, as, as you know, my work really focuses on the, the worst public safety problems in, in the most needful neighborhoods in the country. That's, that's why I get up every day. And the awful fact about that is that these days nearly all of those neighborhoods are, are long troubled, um, very disadvantaged African American neighborhoods. And in those places, there, there is always a terrible overlap of three issues, and they'd be bad enough, each of them on their own, but together it's really unconscionable. Um, so one is, one is violence. And at a time when the national homicide rate is down to between four and five per 100,000 in those neighborhoods, and they're all over the country, if you're a young black man, your homicide victimization rate every year is over 500 per 100,000. And it's mostly gun violence. There will be five or so non-fatal woundings for every homicide. So we're now up to 3,000 or so per 100,000. Basically, 3% of everybody gets shot every year. It's, it, and there it's are, astonishing for there, you. There are street shrines to the dead in, in these places. Um, that same demographic, those same young men, not just them, but overwhelmingly them, are also getting pulled over, stopped, searched, arrested, prosecuted, and sent to prison. And you, you quoted the one in three number, that's right. Um, these are neighborhoods of concentrated school failure, of course. And if you are a young black man who does not finish high school, right now the likelihood that you will go to prison is 70%. So getting hurt, having people who've been shot and killed, going to prison is a normal part of growing up. And the third piece is a deeply, deeply, deeply broken relationship between those communities and law enforcement, especially the police. And all of those things go together, and we have to deal with, with them all. Right. So um, what we've been seeing recently, the, the, the controversy over police uh, behavior has been driven by the fact that there are these cell phone videos that people get to, get to see now. Um, but there have been complaints about police misbehavior since forever. I mean, I've been covering it um, for decades. Um, is there a way to um, explain how serious a problem this is? Is the concern about police uh, violence and brutality overstated? 
Um, is it, uh, you always hear that it's, uh, you know, one bad apple or something like that. Just how serious is this problem? So I think if we look at it as we ought to look at it, so let's, let's start with the national moment that we're in. The, the, the country has realized that there is something fundamentally off balance with respect to not just policing, but the, the relationship of, once again, especially beleaguered black communities with criminal justice. Mm -hmm. And what this is really about I, I believe it's it's the relationship between those communities and the power of the state. And people are not happy, and they haven't been happy for a long time. And really what's happened recently is that the rest of the country has woken up to this. But as you say, this is not, nothing recent. And if we, if we view it as I think we ought to, the experience of um, black Americans in the United States has always been one of oppression by the power of the state. It goes back, in fact, to before the founding of the nation. This nation was, was founded on transportation. It was then formally constituted as a slave nation. The Constitution formally defined black Americans as property and not full human beings. White folks could do essentially anything to blacks and black families that they wanted to, and that was done under color of law. Those laws were enforced by police departments. And white folks act as if this was a long time ago. And the fact is the last of those laws were formally changed only in the early 1960s. So the entire history of the nation up until then was one of formal state oppression of black Americans. Um, and as lots of police executives will say now, we haven't done so well since then. And in, in, in this, this tragic way, the moment after the civil rights reforms of the early 60s became the time of the war on drugs and the rise of mass incarceration, Horrible ideas like the, the, the perversion of, of broken windows into zero tolerance, rampant stop and frisk. Um, and the fact is the entire experience of being policed by black communities, as long as there have been black communities in the U.S., has, has been malevolent. Right. And it has finally caught up with us. Has the... Um dynamic fundamentally changed within law enforcement since that period you were talking about when police could um, oppress and abuse people under the color of law. Um, has that fundamentally changed? In other words, are we seeing a miscommunication? Do, do the communities have reason to believe that the police are essentially out to get uh, black people? Uh, or is that a residue of this period that you're talking about? When, when I try to get my cop friends to understand this, uh, because many of them really don't, and they, they know who they are, they know why they're on the job, they know that they would literally take a bullet for people who hate them, and they really don't understand it. And what I say to them is the, f the, the fact that the community thinks you are a deliberate race predator is not correct. You're right about that. But the fact that they think it is not crazy and you have to understand why they think it. And I break it down into three things. It, there is this long and awful and real history that nobody wearing the uniform today was part of, but their institutions were. The, the, the community memory on that is powerful, and so they wear it still. There is outright illegality and abuse, and good cops and good police department don't like illegality and abuse but as in every institution, some of it is there. So, so it, illegality and the abuse is a real problem it is, now, it is even a, if it is, it is less than problem. it was some decades ago. And in, in the highest risk black communities, it's pretty endemic. So one, one cannot walk with street officers in those places, in most departments around the country, without seeing unconstitutional stops, improper searches, disrespect, um, 
low-level improper use of force, that kind of thing is just routine in a lot of these neighborhoods and the community does not like it. And then there's the, the piece that um, is policy. So we've mentioned New York and stop and frisk a couple of times already. Uh, when your and my police department were stopping 700,000 people, most of them young, young black men, a year in New York City, that was not being done because of individual rogue officers. It was being done because it was the stated policy of the police department. Right. And communities experience that not as well-intentioned mistakes. They, intend, they experience it as, as deliberate, hostile action. And the Vera Institute of Justice, again, here in New York City, has surveyed young people in some of these neighborhoods in New York. Forty percent of them say that they were stopped nine or more times before the survey took place. Eighty-eight percent of them say they don't trust the police. Right. And that is a result of policy. So let's talk about crime in the community, um, which, uh, as you've noted, takes a much greater toll on black lives than police um, misbehavior. Um, but when you get into these communities, if you pay attention, which you have been doing, you, you see and your work uh, bears out that most of the crime and violence is done by a relatively small number of actors, usually in gangs or more loosely organized groups. Um, talk about that a, a, a little bit and explain why these groups, if the numbers are uh, reasonably small, have nevertheless been able to flourish. So let me just go back and be careful about what, what I said. So. Um, let's recognize that no matter where the math may end up, um, this debate about whether police violence or community violence ought to take precedence is generally, I think, deeply mistaken. Um, they both matter. They're different. They're both very important. And we just have to recognize that, that in any community, Having an agent of the state commit illegal violence is special. And that's, that cannot be judged by body counts. Right? It, 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 is, it is different and uniquely significant when your government takes the life of one of your own. And that is, that is the way many, many, many people in these communities experience what's going on. And we ought to respect that distinction and not, not just sort of add up the, the counts on both sides. Um, and then within the community, I, I spend my life working in and devoted to what we think of as, as dangerous high crime places. And they are not dangerous high crime places. They are actually remarkably healthy places in which there are a very few, very high-risk people. And the, this is a place where research is really important, and the, the recent research on this is quite extraordinary. And what it says is that in these places that we have for, for generations been saying these are bad places full of bad people, um, there will be a network of a few percent mostly of the young men. And if you are in that network, so we've recorded some numbers already, um, you are in my homicide risk walking around in the country right now, insignificant. Um, you run the numbers for the country, again, it's between four and five per 100,000. Young men in these places, over 500 per 100,000. If you are in this network of chronic offenders, and this is gang members, drug dealers, street, street guys, and those who, who associate with them, if you're in that tiny little network, 3,000 per 100,000, and then up from there, depending on circumstances. And if, if you are in the most dangerous neighborhoods in the country and you're not in that network, your risk is also insignificant. Your risk of being killed and of hurting somebody else. Right. Everybody else is neither likely to get hurt nor to hurt somebody else. And what we're, what we're learning about this is that you know, 
quite to the contrary, these are not dangerous places full of dangerous people. They're remarkably healthy and resilient because everything we also say about them is right. They've been oppressed, they've been neglected, the schools are terrible, the health care is terrible, there are no grocery stores, families are stressed, all that's right. And despite that, families and communities are healthy enough so that they raise their, their kids and almost none of them are dangerous. So what do we do about those who are dangerous? which is what you've been working on for a very long time. So we, we do two things. We stop treating everybody in the neighborhood as if they're a felon. And when we stop doing what we've been doing and we say to those communities, we, we've been wrong and we get it. We have disrespected you. We have treated everybody as, as high risk. We've pulled everybody over. We've stopped everybody. And in doing that, we have played into terrible history and we have not earned your trust. And we're going to stop doing that. When you do that, the angriest communities, nearly everybody will come to the table and they will find some ways to work with you going forward. The goodwill is there. You've been running programs where, we do this, this is work. not theory, no, you're, not. you're running programs where this occurs. It's, in, um, in these tough neighborhoods that you're talking about. And the result, in most cases, if I understand it correctly, is that crime has gone down significantly. One, one can make 30, 40, 50 percent increases. Um, sorry, we, one, one can make improvements of 30, 40, 50 percent in these neighborhoods within a year or two by, by getting this right. The second thing one does after one essentially reconciles with the rest of the neighborhood is to focus. So you begin engaging the, the folks who are in the neighborhood and the folks who are in these groups or gangs. Absolutely. And so the National Network at John Jay is now hosting this national effort by the Justice Department called the, the National Initiative for Building Community Trust and Justice. And it's focused on procedural justice, on bias, and the third plank, which is getting to what we're talking about, is explicit reconciliation work between law enforcement and these deeply, deeply alienated neighborhoods. And you can do it, clearly can do it. And then one re recognizes that all of the following things are true. The, the high risk for violence is concentrated amongst a very small number of people. When you get to know them, they are not psychopaths. They are trapped, they're scared, they've been hurt, they're desperate, they're not being protected. What the police and the rest of us are doing is not making them safe. Um, they don't feel like they can go to the police when they know somebody's trying to kill them, and so they take care of it themselves, which becomes another incident and often these days vendetta. So one meets that very small kind of street world where, where one finds it and says to them, we know who you are, we know what you're doing, we desperately want to keep you alive and out of prison, we'd like to protect you, we'd like to help you, and this is not a negotiation and we're going to make sure you understand what the legal consequences are going to be if, if you continue. And when that works, and it often does, crime goes down, jail and prison goes down, respect goes up, um, guys get the help they need, and it's better for everybody. Is this expensive? What we're doing right now is unbelievably expensive. <laughs> um, I mean, shockingly expensive, and not buying us what we want. Right. So almost, almost every city that does this work uses the resources that it already has and deploys them differently. You don't need a lot of new money to do this. Right. Um, you uh, were, if I understand it correctly, a philosophy major at Swarthmore when you went and, to... And a history what, minor, I will say. And a, hist yeah. and a history minor. Even with the history minor, it doesn't sound like the background that's going to lead uh, someone into the mean streets of uh, some of the toughest neighborhoods in America. How did you get involved in this work? I wanted to be you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you um, go. Go ahead. I really did. I wanted to be a, a serious journalist. I, that's what I was setting myself up to do after I got out of school. And I was doing freelance magazine work, that whole, that whole thing. Um, but 
to live, I got a wonderful job at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University preparing teaching cases for the faculty. So the Kennedy School is a professional school, like a law school or a business school. Right. It, it uses the case method to teach a lot of what it does. And there was a little office there that was on call for the faculty to go out into the world and write the cases that they wanted for their curriculum. It was, it was like being an investigative reporter, right. except nobody read your stuff, but other than that. <laughs> um, and I got tapped by some really genius law enforcement criminal justice scholars who were focusing on American policing in the mid-1980s. And it was, for me, it was just an assignment like anything else. They sent me out into places where interesting policing was happening. And because it was the mid-80s, a lot of the, the most creative, serious work going on then had to do with the early... Uh, crack epidemic, right? And so, I started walking crack markets all over the country. And these days, I have to say, in a professional capacity, <laughs> right. unlike all the other white folks there. Um, but it 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 got me into these neighborhoods, and what was going on in these neighborhoods was unconscionable. And anybody who saw it would have had the same reaction that I did, which is, this is not okay. This is this is wrong what is going on here it was it was blatant outlandish obvious crime and violence and it's, brutal it's, behavior it's, it's, and drug dealing out in the open uh, small number of people but the majority of the people in these neighborhoods were cowering in their homes because they were afraid to come outside etc people were terrified yeah and the the story that that the, the fact that almost every story about these neighborhoods always wound up with back back then was the mothers are putting their kids to sleep in bathtubs, bathtubs at night. Bathtubs, exactly. Because Worried about gunfire coming into apartment. That's the one place that stray, stray rounds won't penetrate. Um, and you know, this was not a sophisticated analysis. I didn't know any of, of what I know now. I just, it was it was like somebody walking by a swimming pool and there's a kid drowning. You you can't look away, you right. have to do something. And that was exactly the experience that I had. And so it led you into this field where you felt you had to devise ways of coping with these problems and diminishing them. So if you sort of fast forward 10 years from mid 1980s, um, I had been welcomed by this quite extraordinary group of, of not just policing scholars, but also their friends who were on the job in all these different places. And when, one thing about Harvard, when you invite people to come to a meeting, they show <laughs> they up. They show so, up, exactly. Um, and I met the Attorney General of the United States and top FBI people, and I was, I was nobody. You know, I was a puppy running around people's ankles, but I was there. And if if you cared about results on the ground, which was the only thing I really cared about, what was true 10 years later was that nothing had changed. So there was wonderful work going on with community policing and problem-oriented policing and this and that, but, and it was, it was making a difference in a lot of ways. It was not making a difference in these neighborhoods. And so something else had to happen. We're going to have to stop it there. I hope we can uh, bring you back another time and continue this story because I'd like to get into more specifics about your um, work. It's been wonderful. This be half hour has gone too quickly. It's been wonderful. Thanks for coming. You bet. Uh, we'll be back in a moment with a final word. Jerusha Connor, a professor at Villanova University, wrote a compelling piece in U.S. News & World Report about her daughter's first day in kindergarten. The unsuspecting child was bombarded with tests administered by five different teachers. She was tested on such tasks as coloring within the lines, cutting with scissors, identifying letters and their sounds, her ability to count, and on and on. This was kindergarten, mind you. 
After that first day, the poor child was a bundle of nerves. Then the regular school year commenced. When Ms. Connor picked her daughter up after her first real day of kindergarten, she didn't seem any more relaxed. She did not want to talk about what she had done in school, Ms. Connor wrote. But she did say that she did not want to go back. The point of the article was that testing in our public schools has gotten bizarrely out of control. Instead of being welcomed into a warm and nurturing environment, this five-year-old was confronted, in her mother's words, by an intimidating initiation that turned the child off rather than making her feel eager to move ahead and to learn. It's time to take public education back from the data zealots and place it in the hands of parents and teachers with a better understanding of what a well-rounded, first-class education really means. That's all for now. See you next time.